Welcome to God of Glory Ministries. My name is Rod James. Appreciate you joining us today. We're going to be looking today at Romans chapter 9, verses 27 to 29. And we're going to be discussing the uh, Vessels of Mercy, part 2 of that message. We looked at uh, verses 23 to 26 last week. This week we'll be looking at verses 27 to 29. Romans 27, or Romans chapter 9, verse 27 to 29 says, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been a Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. There's a couple of different uh, places where the word remnant is used. And it, it has a few different meanings, but they're all very similar. Uh, it can mean a remainder or a residue. It can mean a few or it can mean a survivor. And... Uh, we get a picture of all of that here from Paul talking about Israel. There's a, there was a remainder. There was a residue. There, there was just a few, just a few survivors at this time left that had accepted Jesus Christ. In the future, there will be a few, a remnant that will accept Jesus Christ from, from the house of Israel, that will come back into God's grace. It, we, we have a picture of God's view of Israel in Isaiah chapter 1, and beginning at verse 2. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Ah, sinful nation of people laden with iniquity and sin, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. He says, my people rebelled against me. They don't consider me. They are sinful. They are a seed of evildoers. They're corrupt, forsaken, provoked, and backslid. They've turned away from the Holy God of the universe. And his response to that is seen in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 15 to 19. You know, if you think you can do anything you want, and God's going to be at your beck and call, you should read this chapter a couple of times. You have to live according to how God wants you to live, and live in faith. And put God, really, really put God first. Or he's under no obligation whatsoever to hear you at all. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 15 to 19. This is God's response to Israel being in a sinful state. It says, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make many prayers, I won't hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall 
eat the good of the land. He's saying you can come back into my covenant graces and I will reward you for it if you turn away from your sin, if you stop living a life of sin, if you actually follow me. They rebelled against God. The, the scripture says the, the stone that the, the builders founded, it, it's become the head of the corner. Yeah, the, the, the chief cornerstone of the whole thing is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they rejected him. They didn't consider him. He said, I'll hide my eyes from you. When you raise your hands in prayer, I'm not going to see it. When you start praying, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to hear you. Your hands in my sight are bloody, and everything that you do is sinful. In Isaiah chapter 10, and verse 22, Isaiah 10, 22 says, For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption, the destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. He's going to destroy them, the word says, with righteousness. Righteousness should be something that comes out of us, from God into us. To say that righteousness would destroy them obviously puts them at odds against God and his righteousness. We're talking about the vessels of mercy. The house of Israel, Paul will go on to say, and so all Israel will be saved. That's only possible by his mercy. That's only possible by his grace, by his sacrifice on the cross for us and for them. You know, this is a people that put to death their Messiah. But they have an opportunity to be vessels of mercy again if they'll receive him you know in, in our text in, in Romans chapter 9 verse 28 it says he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness this is quoting from what we just quoted from in Isaiah it says because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth and that's from Isaiah 28 22 Paul's using scripture to write more scripture, but Paul's taking one scripture and, and sharing it and teaching what, what it meant. He's going to finish the work. And you know, God in creation took six days and then rested the seventh. He finished the work because the creation was done. And we're coming up on what's going to be earth's sixth, sixth day. The, the word says a day to the Lord is just a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Uh, we're coming up on our 6,000th year. And the seventh day, it's going to rest. All the fighting will be done. All the war will be done. All the crime and sin will be done. At the end of time, which is where we're at right now, Jesus Christ is going to come back and set this all straight. It says he's going to finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. He, he's going to put an end to all the nonsense that's going on, to all the crime, to all the wars, to all the hate, to all the sin. He's going to cut it short in righteousness. 
Romans chapter 2, verses 5 to 9, says this, But after your hard and impenitent heart, you treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is righteous. He's going to judge this planet in righteousness. He's going to end all the nonsense that's taking place on this earth with righteousness who will render to every man according to his deeds he's going to pay you what you deserve if you ask for his mercy he will pay you mercy you will be a vessel of mercy if you ask to be forgiven if you ask to be saved you'll be a vessel of mercy but if you stay in your sin and you don't repent you don't turn to him you don't believe in him He's going to render to you. He's going to pay you. He's going to give you exactly what you deserve. The Word of God says that the wages of sin is death. That's separation. Separation from your body and your spirit. Separation from God now spiritually and separation from God in eternity. Death always separates. It will be separation from God in eternity. The wages of sin is death. You might as well write hell in there. The wages of sin is hell, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to avoid hell. He is the only way. It goes on to say to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. That's what Christians are to do. That's what we're supposed to do in our life in servicing the Lord Jesus Christ. Just what he said there in chapter 2, verse 7, who by patient continuance, you know, no matter what's going on, no matter how tough it gets, no matter how hard you have it or think you have it, by patient continuance, you patiently continue in the faith. You continue in the faith. You do the things you're supposed to do every day, every hour of every day, and you patiently continue in the faith. In well-doing, in well-doing, and not, not in going off on tangents and, and cussing and throwing things and, you know, having tantrums and falling off the wagon and drinking or doing drugs or what, whatever sin may be pulling on you. You patiently continue in well-doing, and you seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. That's what we seek. We don't seek out trouble. We don't seek out reasons to be upset. We don't seek out reasons to, to have our lives turned upside down. We seek out these things to keep ourselves on a continual, patient basis of following the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Now you know this isn't going to turn out well. Indignation and wrath. God is indignant against you when you sin against him. He's indignant. And, and it bears forth the fruit of wrath. You, know, you, you, you sow iniquity, you're going to reap wrath and indignation. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jews first and also of the Greek or the Gentile. We are the vessels of mercy because the Lord Jesus Christ came down and died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And we've received it. If you haven't received it, you're a vessel of wrath. It's spoken of earlier in Romans chapter 9. There's only two vessels, vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy.
you decide which path you want to be on. You can be going the wrong way and head straight into hell, or you can turn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and go straight into heaven. He's going to cut it short in righteousness. We don't know exactly the day or the hour when he's going to come back. You know, Jesus said that day shouldn't overtake you as a thief. You should have a really good idea of when I'm coming back. You know, just like when you see leaves turning on the trees and stuff. You know, springs here and summer's close at hand. You should have a really, really good idea when I'm coming back. You know, I'm not much of a soccer fan. But in soccer, they have something called penalty time. A, a, a game or a match will go on for 90 minutes. And then all of a sudden, you know, the game's over. But they keep playing because they're in penalty time. It could be a minute, two minutes, three minutes. They don't have a clock that shows how long it is. You know the end's coming quickly. But you don't know exactly how long. It's not like in football or basketball, you know, when you can see the clock counting down. Or in baseball, when you know you got one out to go. You know, it, it is literally a picture of Jesus Christ coming back first for his church and then after that coming back to judge the world. Because we don't know exactly when this game's going to be over. We know it's it's got to be close. We're in penalty time on planet Earth. We're in penalty time right now. Of that day and hour knows no man. He didn't say you couldn't know the decade or you couldn't know the year. Or you certainly should know what generation you're in. You know, Jesus said the generation that would see Jerusalem taken back by Israel wouldn't pass away until all these things be fulfilled. All of them. The judgment, the second coming, everything. That happened in 1967. We're in penalty time. We're, we're in extra time right now. This game could be over at any second. You better be ready for it. He says a short work in our text will God make of the earth. It's not going to be some big battle. You know, it's not going to. It's not going to take a day or a week or a year or 10 years like like a normal war would when jesus comes back and lands on this planet the game is over he he is almighty god coming back to this planet and there won't be anything anybody can do about it time is almost up you can't see the seconds ticking down, but you have to know the game's almost over. He says the Lord of Sabaoth, and that means God's armies. The, the, the church of Jesus Christ is the armies of God. In, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, we, we see a picture of Jesus Christ coming back with his armies. And the church, the church in heaven, the church triumphant, the church that's already gone through this planet, the church that's already left this planet, is going to be the church that comes back with him to this planet. Re Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, John writes, as he saw the revelation of Jesus Christ coming back. The, the, the revealing. That's what the book of Revelation is about. The revealing of Jesus Christ. Who he is. How he's going to judge. What he expects of his church. What's going to happen in the future. And his unveiling when he comes back. And this is when that moment happens. John writes, he said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Just like Paul said in our text, 
with righteousness. Like Isaiah said in chapter 10, the, the destruction proclaimed will overflow with righteousness. Paul said he's going to cut this thing short in righteousness. Isaiah and Paul and Brother John all agree this thing is going to end up being burnt up by the righteousness of God. In righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, and that as Christians is us, followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That is purity and righteousness. A spotless, holy church, a righteous church, a church that is able to pronounce judgment and able to execute judgment with him and on his behalf because we've done what he said to do. We've adhered to what he said to adhere to. We followed the, 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 the one that's called the way, the truth, and the life. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. The, the word of God is called alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word is coming out of his mouth, and John sees it as a sword that's just going to cut in half everything that comes against it. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. What happened to the loving God of, of the Bible? God's supposed to love, and God does love, but you missed it. You're on the wrong side of it. If you're still on planet Earth when this happens, you got problems. You, you need to be behind him coming back with him, because if you're in front of him, you're about to have the longest day you can ever imagine. He's going to destroy everything that is evil. He's going to wipe out everything that is wicked. He's going to replace everything that is sinful and disgusting and an abomination in his sight with his righteousness. In righteousness, he's going to judge and make war. It's going to be overran with righteousness. It's going to be taken away lot like a, a river of lava that's made up of righteousness. And we're in penalty time. We're, we're in extra time right now. This game could end at any time. You know, for the church, Romans 8.37 says, We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. That, that word in the Greek is hupernikaio, and it means to vanquish beyond a decisive victory. It means to crush your opponent. And when your opponent's down, to step on them, to destroy. We are more than conquerors. We, we defeat Satan and sin and death and hell because of him we are more than conquerors through him that loved us that loved us enough that god almighty died on a cross for us and shed his blood for us and is coming back for us jesus said i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you i'm going to come again and get you and take you to where i am he's going to come scoop us up and take us to his kingdom. And then after a period of time, a short period of time, we will return with him. So you have to be gone to come back. We're going to leave, and then we're going to return, just like he left, and he's going to return. He left a seed for Israel because 
they have an opportunity to be the vessels of mercy. Just like we have an opportunity. It's not for just Jews anymore. It's not just for the Gentiles. It's not just for men. It's not just for women. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. The gospel is open to all. We've all been given the opportunity to be the vessels of honor. And the vessels of mercy. He left a seed for Israel. There's always some Jewish believers. There's always a small amount of them. Like any seed, when that seed comes to fruition and, and it, it brings forth like it, it's it's an apple tree it's not going to stay a small seed forever it, it's going to break forth and become a tree and out of that tree is going to give life sustaining fruit he left a seed and that seed's going to turn into something glorious to God in the last days. He allowed them to remain that they could have a chance. You know, Romans 12, 3 says that he has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That word dealt is marizo. It means to share or to divide or to give a part of. He has shared and divided and given a part of the faith he's talking about. The word measure in that verse that I've shared with you many times is metron. It's a limited portion or degree. He shared, divided, and given a part of a limited portion of faith to everybody. So that they have an opportunity to ask. They have an opportunity to receive what Jesus did on the cross. He said if you don't. If they don't. They're going to end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to judge in righteousness. He, he's, he's going to destroy everything that's wicked with righteousness. Yeah, you know, in Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 to 16, and verse 22, it says, When the morning arose, there was angels that tried to hurry up Lot. Lot was left in the city that was about to be destroyed. They told him, he said, Arise and take your wife and your two daughters which are here, unless you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Unless you get destroyed in the punishment that's coming, you need to get out of it. You know, whatever sin you're in, you need to get out of it. Now, this is a picture of sin. It's a picture of judgment. It's, it's a picture of what's going to happen to this whole planet at some point in the near future. While he lingered, he didn't want to leave. He was comfortable there. He was comfortable in that abominable city. And we can't be comfortable in our sin. If you're comfortable in your sin, then you're not comfortable in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be both. You, you either follow him or you follow what you want to do. But you can't do both. He lingered. The, the, the angels grabbed a hold of his hand. And upon the hand of his wife and upon the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. Lot was a vessel of mercy. He, he was a vessel of mercy. God still considered him a righteous person. He just needed to get away from the sin. 
God wanted to save him from this. The Lord being merciful on him, they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought him out of the city that he said, escape for your life and don't look back. Escape for your life and don't look back. That's good advice. Get out of your sin and don't look back. We're in penalty time on God's game time. It, the game is over. We're in extra session right now. Verse 22, the angel tells him, hurry up. And escape from here because I can't do anything till you leave this place. That's a picture of the rapture. The angel told Lot, he said, we're, we're going to burn this place to the ground. But I can't do anything till you leave. Because God won't destroy even one righteous person. If there is any righteous people, just one righteous person left on this planet, God won't destroy it. God won't judge his righteous people. Their sins have already been nailed to the cross of Christ. Their sins have already been paid for. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. There's no judgment. To them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, not after sin, but after righteousness. There's no judgment if we follow him. Jesus said in Luke 21, 36, Pray always that you be counted worthy to escape these things that are going to come upon the earth. It's a worldwide judgment. The only way you can escape a worldwide judgment is to leave the world. That's the rapture. Revelation 4.1, it says, come up hither. That's a picture of the rapture. When John's taken up from here into heaven. In Revelation 3.10, it says, he, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, the hour of tribulation, the hour of judgment, which is going to take over the whole earth. The word from, I will keep you from, is the word ek, and it means out of. I will keep you out of the time of tribulation that's going to overtake the whole earth. I will keep you out of it. We're in penalty time on planet Earth. Next week, I'm going to go into what I intended to do this week, but we're, we're already at a point where this message would end up being an hour and a half, and I don't want to do that. So we're going to continue the Vessels of Mercy next week. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, and see exactly why God declares mercy upon us, how we can stay in his mercy, and what all we receive mercy from. But we're going to tie Romans 9, 27 to 29, together with Daniel 9, 1 to 23. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very beneficial sometimes to, to group scripture together. To, to see exactly what is being talked about. It, just like Paul went back and looked at Isaiah and looked at Hosea and was quoting those scriptures to explain to them what he was talking about. But we're going to do that next week. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 to 23 and, and, and see that his mercy is so amazing.
I've said over and over again that faith is the key word in the Bible, and all is the biggest word in the Bible, and mercy is the greatest word in the Bible. Without mercy, we're all dead. Without mercy, we're all in hell. Without mercy, we have no chance, but God is merciful. God shows mercy to us every day, and God showed the greatest mercy to us on the day that Jesus Christ was crucified to save the people of this planet. The, the angel announced, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. It's to all people. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. The word says that he is the savior of all men, especially those that believe. We have to come to him and receive him. And when we do, he, he, he gives us the greatest gift we can ever have, and that is his mercy and his salvation. Would you close with me with a word of prayer, please? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this message just now. I pray that it would be a blessing to those that hear it. I thank you so much for them joining us, Lord. I, I pray that this message is a blessing to them. I know that as they stay in your word, it will be a great blessing to them and, and will lead them to the path of righteousness, which we must go down. If you are out there just now and you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you mean business with God and you really want to follow him and really want to be a Christian, pray this prayer with me and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you shed your blood for me as a one-time perfect sacrificial offering for my sins and the sins of the entire world. I pray that you, you would come into my life just now, Lord, and lead me the way that I need to be led and, and allow me to follow you, Lord. I, I set down my sin. I give up my sin. I turn away from it, and I follow you. Make me your child just now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. We, we will continue this message next week. And uh, Daniel chapter 9 is, is an amazing portion of Scripture, as all Scripture is. But when it comes to talking about God's mercy, it, uh, it is filled full to the rim with the mercy of God. God bless you. We'll see you next week. And have a great week. Amen.